just now getting started and established in truth. And I'm just kind of amazed that there's, I heard Russ Dizdar say something this week that really resonated with me that he said, when you look at those in the occult and paganism in so many areas of even understanding how we work, they're light years ahead of us. They're 50, 60 years ahead of us. And it, it, it seems like most of the body of Christ, we're kind of still in the dark ages about a lot of things. And it's not because it's not there in the word. It's because our traditions have held us back from really understanding. I remember when, when I was just teaching on how our habits and, and different things function, and, and it was just kind of, of just a breakthrough for some folks. I mean, that, that's basic neuroscience that agrees with the word of God. And when some of the people say, well, I would never share that from the pulpit. Well, then where are you going to really get it from that you know that's balanced out with truth? Guys, we, we, God needs to do an advancement to us. There, there are ways of moving in this earth in the kingdom of God that always bring healing, always bring wholeness. God can, and the amazing thing is how many seen people that, and movie stars and all that that get all this wealth, the next thing you know, they're ODing on, 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 on prescription drugs and, and their wealth adds harm, it adds sadness to it. God's kingdom is so awesome that when God does it, he adds no sadness to it. That takes divine wisdom, that takes divine understanding. Now, one of the things that, that I, I love, and, and God has allowed me in, in many situations, both with uh, Dr. John Gar, with the colloquiums he had, and, and some other things that I've went to, I have had the pleasure of, 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 of debating scripture and concepts with guys that were, that basically their intellect and their understanding of Semitic languages eclipsed me. I felt like a kid standing there with some of these guys. I remember one time I was sitting there and, and had a Messianic rabbi who had a Ph.D. in Semitic language, who had a minor in physics. I had two guys with Ph.D.s in physics, had two or three preachers, and we got to talking about how, the, how that the, the new concepts within physics of the holographic universe lines up with the word and all these different things. And we were just kind of breaking during lunch. And we just got so involved and the Spirit of God just began to bring revelation after revelation after revelation. And finally, someone intruded and said, you know, it's time for dinner. It had been five hours, just like that. And, and all of us walked away just saying, boy, boy we, we should have taped this. It was so awesome. Because iron was sharpening iron, and as we, it, it, it was an impromptu yeshiva. Yeah. And then I've been at others, guys, that I had men that make my education look like it was in kindergarten, really, who were intellectually, but the Spirit of God wasn't there. And what, what is frightening to me, now they were, they were internationally respected experts in their field. So I'm not, and you know, how did you end up there, providence of God? Because I don't think, I'm, I'm a jack of all trades and a master of none. Sometimes I feel like, because I, I like to be so collective. But God put me there. And so as we begin to debate, they, they were very intellectual. They, they, they knew nuances of the Hebrew and different Semitic languages that, uh, that were just so far above me. But there was no anointing. There was no wisdom of God. It was just, <laughs> and I'm thinking, you guys are scary because you're training preachers. And uh, I see the same thing. It's, it's not just religion. It's in, in the secular world. I saw here probably about five or six years ago, I think it was James Dobson, but I, it's been a while. But they were, they were sharing about the problems we're having with Social Security, and, you know, making sure that because we have a lot of people getting ready to retire. And he said, well, the problem is through all the abortions, we have reduced the population of this next age. Uh, of the current group that should be out in the workforce. And boy, that was poo-pooed by the secular people. Oh, you're nonsense. It's nonsense. It's just ridiculous. Last night, I heard one of the directors of the Harvest, Harvard Business School say, you know, one of our problems is we, we, we have not increased in our population the way that we should, and so there's not enough out there working in the workplace to fund those that are retiring. Not only that, there's not enough out there of, of the next generation that should have expanded to increase, to, to, uh, to expand the need for goods, the need for services so that business could expand. And so what we need is immigration reform so that we can bring all these immigrant in. And I'm thinking, but you're not putting the other thing to it. We're in this situation because you approved abortion. It, 
And it's like, okay, this guy was a Harvard-educated, Harvard super think tank kind of guy that couldn't put, could not put the abortion thing in the thing. And sometimes I look at these guys and saying, two plus blank equal four, and you can't get the other two to understand why you got the four. Have you ever felt like that? Or, or sometimes you're talking to Christians even, and you open up the word and you show them in black and white, and not just in one verse. You show them here, you show them here, you flip over here, you show them here. You show them the continuity of the word, and they look at you, and they just get this blank expression on their face. Well, he just don't believe it that way. Well, how many know God does if you, if you have that many witnesses? One of the things that, uh, that we don't understand is the difference between information and knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. These are all different components of what we call knowledge or we call our understanding. You can have a lot of information, but there's no really knowledge in the information. There's no real knowledge because the information has been tainted. You can have knowledge and no understanding on how to use it. I've been around a while, and I've seen a lot of people that were educated beyond their intellect. There have been a few times I've been there, a few times myself. Then God worked on me. And you can have understanding, but you don't have the wisdom on what to implement. And here's another one. Wisdom not only tells you what you should implement, it should tell you what you should mess with. Because there's some knowledge that will never do you any good. I mean, there's knowledge where you can destroy lives and that you can destroy thousands of people, millions of people. That's a knowledge, but it's not good knowledge. We need to understand that there, within, within all information, within all knowledge, wisdom, and understanding, there is a spiritual nature to it. And if you don't not recognize its spiritual nature, you'll never truly move in it, nor can you guard yourself against the other side. Either God is empowering these things in our life, or the enemy is, and there's no neutral ground. There's none. There's no neutrality. Because there has to be an unction. There has to be an anointing come to move us into information, knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. If you have your Bibles this morning, I want to go to Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7. We need to understand there were only two trees in the garden that were of great importance. Now, sure, they probably had apple trees and, and uh, all kinds of fruit trees, but there were two of importance. Now, one of them, God told man that he could never eat of, but he never told him that he couldn't eat of the second one, the tree of life, until after he ate of the first one. But look at this. It says, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that ye shall eat thereof, ye shall surely die. And then we can look in Genesis 3 and 22. Now, this is after man has sinned. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil. Now, lest he put forth his hand and take of the tree of life and live forever. And so he, he banishes him out because he's, there were two trees. Trees have something called fruit. God calls knowledge fruit. But within that fruit, there's always seed. And that seed produces after its own kind. Have you ever seen anybody that was deceived and the deception just becomes greater and greater and greater and greater? Why? That fruit went to seed and that seed sprouted. The Bible talks a lot about the seed. Even when, when God was talking to Eve, he said, listen, from your seed now, your seed is going to crush his head. He's going to, you know, it's like he's going to hurt his heel, but he's going to crush his head. And that seed, Satan has a seed, and God has a seed. And everything since the beginning of time has went where there's two groups of people and there's two groups of anointing to come into knowledge. It's always been that way. And if we don't understand that, we, we miss so much of what God wants to do. Now, the Jewish people understood the spiritual connection to knowledge. How many of the Jewish people sit back and, and watch what happened in Babylon? And there was dark knowledge that was used to conquer nations and all these different things. They knew where it had derived from Nimrod that had stumbled across or it was kept within his own family line. How many of those, there was a guy on the ark named Ham 
And I, it's, I always remember, to, it's easy to remember the bad one. How many know Ham's not kosher? There was something not kosher on the ark. And some of the hidden knowledge that was given to man, isn't that what Satan promised? He said, I'm going to give you knowledge that God won't let you have because the, the, the day that you eat thereof, you're going to be like God. And he promised all this knowledge. And then later on, we find in the book of Enoch, that which describes what happened in Genesis chapter 6, that fallen angels came and began to give forbidden knowledge to man. One of them, the most heinous, was Azazel. That he taught men how to war, he taught men how to make poisons, he taught men all these different things. And what's interesting, on the Day of Atonement, when you have, you have the two goats, and you have one for God, and the other one that you send off in the wilderness to die... When the high priest lays hands, said, this is for Azazel. <laughs> All the, replication, or the repercussions of the knowledge that he gave that has permeated mankind, it's going to wander off into the wilderness and die. And so the Jewish people were very, very familiar that, that there is a spiritual application. And they saw, the, they saw the, uh, the Babylonian Empire. They saw Egypt. They saw Assyria. They saw uh, all these different ones, the Roman Empire raise up and the, Greek, the Greeks raise up with knowledge that didn't, was not derived from God. Now, was it knowledge? Yes. And, you know, some of it, when I look at it, 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 it just, just grieves my spirit. My, my wife looks at, at algebra and says, that's got to be of the devil. <laughs> you know? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's some of this stuff. And, and, what, and I, I think there's actually probably some documentation, if you will, behind that, because whenever you examine the things of the occult, they, they, they have to work calculations, and they work geometric shapes, and they work all this, all this stuff out to try to do the magic that they do, and the workings that they do, there's algebraic equations and all kinds of stuff with it. And so the Jewish people had always understood there's a spiritual nature to wisdom and knowledge. Let's look here in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. How be it we speak wisdom among them that are perfect or mature, yet not the wisdom of this world. Notice there's a dichotomy here. Wisdom of God, wisdom of this world. Nor for the prince of, uh, princes of this world that come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world unto our glory. So he said, listen, there's two wisdoms here. Not all wisdom is from God. And I've even seen men get on Christian television purporting godly wisdom, but there's a darkness to it. And then when you find out what's going on in his life, it's all dark, guys. It's not the wisdom of God. It's devilish. It's sensual. So you can boast about wisdom, and it sounds mysterious, and it sounds fascinating, but it can be the wrong kind of wisdom. There's a wisdom that comes from God, and there's a wisdom that comes from this world. Let's go on here a little bit further. Picking up at verse 10. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. So how do we get the wisdom that we needed? It was revealed by God. God's spirit. It had to be spirit anointed, spirit imparted, spirit that the spirit of God that precipitated it, that set some things in motion, that brought something to your attention. For yea, the spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man save the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. For we now receive not the spirit of this world. Underline that in your Bible. I do not receive the spirit of this world. The spirit of this world is not going to become my tutor. It will say, I will come and I'm going to give you wisdom. I'm going to give you understanding. I'm going to give you all these things, that, all this dark knowledge. And it will destroy you and it will destroy all those around you. Last night we were watching a documentary. We found out a lot of Jesse Ventura's, the, the, the conspiracy theory stuff is now on YouTube. Because I've been wanting to watch it. And they had to think about the Bilderbergers. And all these guys are supposed to, and, and they all move in arcane knowledge. Almost all of them are masons. They move in all this arcane knowledge stuff, and they're, they're basically controlling the world. 
Well, part of their great wisdom is they would like to reduce the population by 80%. In fact, they, they, there's something called the, the Georgia Stones. Google it. And so the, the, this guy shows up, and, and uh, his name is R.C. Christian, that paid millions of dollars to have this thing erected. It's all these different languages. And one of the first things it says is the world population needs to be brought down to 500 million. Uh, it's 8 billion. That means 80. They, so here's the wisdom that we want to prescribe is that we are going to poison your food, poison your water, poison your medicine, because when we've really tripped the trigger, our desire is to cull. You know what culling is like if you have a big flock and you want to, it's getting too big for the pasture, you cull it down. They look at us like cattle because they're moving in this dark knowledge and we're going to cull it down to 500 million. That's by the wisdom of the spirit of this world. They're wanting to do that. How many know it's getting harder and harder just to find good food anymore? It is. It is. We, we see corporations, it wasn't enough that they sprayed poison on it, now they're genetically modifying it, and they're wiping out any competition. And they're trying to kill all the bees, and then they're working up mechanical bees so that you've got to pay them to pollinate your contaminated crops to, to grow the junk that they want you to eat, while they themselves, most elite of the world, all they eat is organic product, by the way. That's just something I just want to throw out there. Uh, but look at this. For we have, we have received not the spirit of this world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know. Underline that in your Bible, that we might know. God's got a lot of stuff he wants you to know. Now, some of us have been around for a while. There's a lot of snow on the roof and a sagging in the timbers. And... Uh, some of the things that God has been having us teach here, I wish I'd have had when I was 18. My God. It would have knocked me, because back then I was stuck on stupid, guys. Could have prayed for our kids, could have made right decisions. We don't understand how, now it's those of us that are older, how many of us made the wrong decision when we were younger and it's still messing with us today. We see that concept in the Bible. Abraham and Sarah decided they were going to help out God and produce an Ishmael. And how many know we're still messing with Ishmael today? We're not taught that the decisions that we make when we're young can have repercussions. Now, can God forgive us? Yes, but it does not stop the repercussions. It keeps on going and going and going because we moved with a different knowledge that had a different anointing to produce a different fruit. That if we'd have simply known, we'd have stopped, paused, prayed, and allowed the Holy Spirit to give us something different to do, that my decision could have been different. That we might know the things that are freely given unto us of God. There's a bunch of stuff that God wants to freely give you. But the only way that you're going to have access to it is by letting His Spirit teach you. It cannot be intellectually discerned there's no void. Intellectualism does not work by itself. It must be empowered something in the spirit realm, and either the spirit of this world or the spirit of God is, is activating it and allowing it to function. You don't know. Guys, have you ever this got into the word about something? It's just like you're looking at all this research, and all of a sudden, just some things just kind of start leaping off at the page to you. It's the Holy Spirit saying, this is important, ignore this. This is important, not this. It's the Holy Spirit doing this, and the more you get into it, the more excited you get. And guys, I've done that not just with the Word. I've done it with physics. I've done it with a lot of different things. And I'm, I'm, I'm kind of kicking myself sometimes that I didn't let him function that way as he should. Because I, I mean, no, God can show you how to get your health back. God can show you how to, how to do a lot of things if you just listen to him. Because you, you can't just look at what's being, all this information that's being disseminated. Last week, fish oil was wonderful for you. Take as much of it as you can. Just get it in jugs. Glug, 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 glug. Now, now if you, you take all this fish oil, you now have a 71% higher chance of prostate cancer, the bad kind. 
Well, one of the things that I think is they, they take all the fish nobody wants. A lot of it's unclean fish, and they oil it, and they sell it to you. It's tainted. In fact, a lot of me look at it's mackerel. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't even remember if mackerel's clean or not, but I know it's, I don't think, it's not clean. Uh, what's the other one? Anchovy. Anchovy and mackerel make up most of it, but it, it's filtered. Don't care. There might be something encoded into its DNA that does bad things to your body, but yet they're selling it to us. And I, I had one professor that some people poo-pooed here years ago that said, quit getting your oil from fish. Get it from organic vegetable sources. Oh, they all poo-pooed him and kind of drove him out. Now he's being validated by the new research that's coming out. And one of the best ones that, that's coming out right now is from chia seed. And so how do we, how do we, how do we weed through all this stuff because they, they say one thing, then they say another. There's a guy in the middle who says, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but this, 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 this. How do you weed through all that information? Because we're being bombarded with double speak every day. The Holy Spirit's got to say, listen to that, ignore this. I frustrate my doctor. Because I tell him, no. They're not used to that. They're, they're trained to be like God's. You do this or you die because if you don't do this, I can give you the sentence you have three weeks. So let it be written, so let it be done. No, I serve a greater God. And I've met a lot of people that were given three weeks 30 years ago. Because God not only touched them but told them, quit listening to your doctor and do this, 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 and this. And when I first started going to my doctor, didn't know anything about nutrition and stuff, I said, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do this. You're crazy. I don't care. Give me six months. Come back. Huh. <laughs> Listening. Let the Spirit of God show you. And I guarantee you that the Spirit of God never told me to pick up that bag of Doritos and finish the whole bag in one time either. A lot of times he said, why don't you put that down and go get an apple? There's another wisdom. There's another wisdom. I'm learning to do that more and more. I'm learning when God says, just fast today. He's done that a couple of times this week, and I've come out of it feeling a whole lot better than I went into it. Why? Why do I go? I don't know. He told me to. There's wisdom in, there's wisdom in obedience. Being able to listen to the Spirit of God. Why? Because he's wanting to release to me all things that were freely given unto us. But if I don't let him, we can't get it. You can write bigger checks every week. Isn't that, isn't that this, the stopgap measure right now that's promoting the body of Christ? Just write a bigger check. Give a bigger offering. Your offering can't outdo your disobedience, and your offering can never outdo letting the Spirit of God release within you the things that were freely given unto you. Now, I'm not preaching anti-giving, but I, what I am preaching is you need to give because the Holy Spirit told you to give not as a way of penance of, of over trying to overcome your disobedience. Go back and let the Spirit of God correct you and show you to begin implementing the things he was trying to get to you when you weren't listening to him that caused the trouble to begin with. I don't know about you. This is good this morning. I'm preaching to me. You guys can just kind of come in on this just a little bit. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth. So man's wisdom can't teach these things but which the Holy Ghost teaches. The Holy Spirit wants to teach you. There, there are two competing forces. The Spirit of this world is trying to teach you, and the Spirit of God is trying to teach you, and the fruit that you get in your lives depends upon who you're letting teach you. Comparing spiritual things with spiritual, but the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are, not, they are spiritually discerned. So not only is there wisdom and understanding, but it has to be discerned spiritually. So there are two anointings to understand. Because I, I, I've read guys that are not walking with God. One of them is this guy that's working on the, the new AI singularity. And what, what he's trying to do is to create an artificial intelligence that becomes self-aware, like Skynet on Terminators. How many know that didn't go well? Okay. And he talks about 
how that during the day as he's doing that, there's this force, there's this anointing, and he gets so excited, and things come together in ways that he could never imagine. And he goes to bed at night so excited about the possibilities, and in the middle of the night, he wakes up in nightmares that what he's getting ready to do might destroy the planet. See, there's an anointing that's driving him, giving him dark knowledge. Because Satan has something that he wants to do in the earth. And so he's equipping men that don't know God. He's placing an anointing on them that that might seem good. It's the knowledge of good and evil. It looks good, but it creates... Come on. Well, wouldn't the singularity be wonderful? It could, it, by, by simulating all the information of the human race and taking it to the next level, the first day could give us a cure for cancer. It could. The next day, it might look at the earth and say, well, the cure for the earth is to reduce the population by 80%. How many know that's a bad thing? So there are, there are two anointings to understanding. There are two types of knowledge, and there's two types of wisdom. One's from God, the other is not. Now look here at what the serpent told Eve. The serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, for, the, for God doth know that in the day that ye eat thereof, your eyes will be opened, and ye shall be as gods. You know, that's what, that's what the occult have striven to do ever since the beginning of time. The whole thing with Nimrod, that Nimrod became a mighty hunter before the Lord, that there was something that Nimrod did, that there was an apotheosis that went on. Apotheosis to means be, go from being a man to a god. That's what's behind all Freemasonry. That's what's behind the Illuminati. And even those, and I've shared this before, those that, that, that didn't believe in God, even in the foundation of, the, of, of this nation that didn't believe in God, like Thomas Jefferson, who, who he said, that, that's beyond reason. If it's not reasonable, they would dismiss it. So they dismiss the supernatural. They dismiss the virgin birth. They dismiss Moses parting the Red Sea. They dismiss all these things because it's not reasonable. Yet those same men, now how's this for reasonable? These same men believe that if they can become mighty enough, then in their next life they become a god. Who's stuck on stupid? And see, that's universal. That's universal behind all of of the occult and paganism and Freemasonry. They want to become gods. They're still latching on to what Lucifer said, that the day that you have this knowledge, and they're still trying to get all that knowledge, that's why the fallen angels came, and they they always make deals. They say, listen, we'll give you this knowledge. You give us your women. You give us this knowledge. You give us control. We We can see that not only... I mean, there's a reason why God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. It was because of the influence of the Nephilim. He flooded the earth because of the Nephilim. God, and how many know we we serve a loving, merciful God, but when it comes to the Nephilim, there's no mercy. He told Israel, if they're in your lands, kill them without mercy. Destroy every man, woman, and child. Why? Because, first of all, they're not human, and they're, they're, they're the ones that are the, that are the resource and the, and the ones that are the proprietary purpose of this dark knowledge in the earth. You say, why are you sharing all that? Because I believe a lot of the people today that are in government, that are in secret societies, that are in the Bilderbergers, are drawing their knowledge from the dark side, if you will. Let me show you a character. This is Aliester Crowley. He's known as one of the most evil men that ever lived. He changed his name, but it used to be Crowley, then he changed it to Crowley so that it would rhyme with holy, which he was the opposite. His mother named him the beast. How many know that if your mama calls you the beast, that's a bad thing? Okay. This guy was brilliant. He could play, I think it was like either 20 or 30 chess games at the same time while being blindfolded. His intellect was through the roof. Notice all his regalia. He had every honor of every type of Masonic order and occultic order in existence in Europe. 
of the OTO, of, of uh, the Knights Templar, of the Masonic Lodge, of all these things. He was as high up as you could go. And he had this being over here named Lam, an angel, if you will, fallen angel, that appeared to him and began to give him things. One of the things he gave him was called the Book of the Law. Huh. How many others? Five books of the law. The book of the law. And Lom came to him between World War I and World War II and, and said, listen, the, the, the era of the Christ child or the dispensation of the Christ child is over. That we're entering into the, the homo noeticus, this, this new man type of thing. Now, isn't it awful interesting that Lom kind of looks like E.T. here? Looks a lot like him. Now, I didn't get a scary look at E.T. here because we have kids here. I mean, there's some really ones out there that make your hair kind of stand up on end when you look at them, and I don't necessarily want to scare anybody. But what's interesting, when you look at the book of Enoch, we, we have the, the watchers, the, the fallen ones, and in Enoch, it gives a judgment that they're going to be basically incarcerated and put away from man for 70 generations. That, and if you, you kind of calculate... Uh, the, the Noah's Flood and the Book of Enoch, all that was about 3,500 years ago or so. It puts them being released between World War I and World War II. And so they start coming and they start giving secret knowledge. You look at the Nazis, and the Nazis had something called trans-channelers, which were, that were communing with these beings that were telling them about the thousand-year reign and, and going back to Aryan blood. We think that's white folk. No. It has nothing to do with white folks. When you really get to the very core of it, they were trying to help get the Nazis back to a, a pure Nephilim bloodline. Now, because of this guy, with all the different orders, the OTO, the Golden Dawn, the Masonic Lodge, the Rose of Christians, he began embedding all his knowledge into all those organizations because they were already looking for it. They're already, much of it was already embedded in it. So every senator that we have, every congressman that we have, every president that we have, that's a Freemason, is spiritually tied into this guy who has knowledge that came from this guy and even worse. And listen to see if this has an... In, how, many know that, how many know the body of Christ wouldn't listen to a Satanist? Shouldn't listen to a Satanist? Every crit, well, I would never listen to anything that came from this one. This, this guy was, I mean, this guy was bad, bad, evil. Human sacrifices, uh, pedophilia, rape, everything that you can think of while doing magical workings, this guy did. This guy was so powerful that during World War II, he had to hide from Hitler because Hitler believed that he was the only one adept enough in occultic power that could take Hitler down. And so Hitler was hunting him saying, I want to take over the world, not you. Okay. In the book of the law, its theme is do what thou wilt, do what you will, do what you want. That's the whole of the law. Now, is that not being preached from Christian pulpits today? It's all under the blood. Just do what you want. Christian, when you stand against God's law, you come in line with this guy and you came up with this spirit, yeah. this demonic spirit. L.A. Marzulli when he looks at everything that all the aliens have said as they show up, and how guys, well, that happened in the 80s, that happened in the 90s. Right now on the planet, these guys show up, and there's either sightings or abductions every 15 minutes somewhere on the planet. And they have a gospel. Now, if you come from Alpha Centauri or Reticuli or, or, or any of these other gl globes or any of these other uh, solar systems, why is it all of them don't like the blood of Jesus? Why is it all of them have a problem with the gospel? They don't, they, don't, they don't come against Muhammad. They don't come against Buddha. They don't come against Nietzsche. They don't come against anything. They have another gospel, and that gospel is always opposed to the God of this Bible and the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why would somebody, not from our neighborhood, if you will, in the galaxy, or why are they so worried about Jesus? Maybe 
then the last days part of the great deception is they have come to be teachers of men to give of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Who's teaching you this morning? I mean, not who's teaching you when you leave here? I know who's teaching you now, and I'm trying my best to do it by the right spirit, the spirit of God. But there are, there are two spirits. John 4, 1 John 4 and 6. We are of God. He that knoweth God, that he, he that knoweth God, God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us, whereby we know the spirit of what? The spirit of truth and the spirit of? Two different spirits in this world. The spirit of truth and the spirit of error. When you read 1 John, the spirit of error is antichrist. It's an antichrist spirit. And so he is, he, when, you, when you read all of 1 John, you either have what the spirit of God is doing or what the spirit of antichrist is doing. And the spirit of antichrist hates the commandments. He that saith, he, that, 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 that knows him and keeps not his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. Not only the truth, but how about maybe the spirit of truth? And right now, there's a lot of spirit of error. The spirit of error has been working so long in the body of Christ, we now call it dogma. There's a dogma that God's commandments have been done away with. There's a dogma that we serve a different God than the God of the Old Testament. There's dogmas going around that are for the dogs. They're not of God because they have been taught by the spirit of error. And that same spirit of error that does that has embedded itself in evolution, has embedded itself in eugenics, has, built, has embedded itself in so many different areas. This wisdom that it gives descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, and what? Devilish. How many know that's the truth? 1 John 4, 1 through 3, Beloved, not every, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they of God, because many false prophets are gone out of the world. Now, the subject, what he's getting ready to say, are false prophets, not just spirits. It's the spirits empowering and have taught the false prophets, okay? Whereby we know that the Spirit of God, every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And so I see people say, well, I try the spirits when they come to me. Has Jesus Christ come in the flesh? How many know right now any moron on the street would tell you that there was a real Jesus that lived and he was in the flesh? But unless you deal with the real Jesus, who is Jesus? He is Emmanuel. He is almighty God come in the flesh. He is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob come in the flesh. Now, we got a lot of guys that say, well, sure, Jesus came in the flesh. He did flesh. He, well, he was a good teacher. He, you know, it's a shame. He's a nice Jewish boy, but unfortunately, they crucified him. No. If you have that attitude, you're Antichrist. It's another spirit that has taught you. You're listening to a spirit that denies it. And, this, and, and, uh, and everyone that confesses not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, this is the spirit of Antichrist. Now notice spirit here is in italics. Where is it at? That means it's not there in the original. He's dealing with the spirit of a thing, but he's saying, listen, these people is, is of Antichrist. Wherefore we have heard this, uh, that this should come, and even now already is in the world. And so it's not having an angel appear to you and you say, has Jesus Christ come in the flesh? Well, they'll agree with you, but so will the devil. The Bible says even demons believe and tremble. If you look at the fruit of what they're teaching, does it deny who Jesus is and what he has done? I kind of wonder what showed up to Darwin to promote evolution. He really wasn't all that sharp. In fact, the, when, the, when he went on this trip where he got all this revelation, and uh, in fact, a lot of this revelation that he got, he actually borrowed from his grandfather, if you actually study history. But the, the captain that allowed him on the ship kind of thought he was a buffoon. How many know that's not good? <laughs> and yet this guy comes up with all this stuff. 
What's so dangerous about it? Well, if you're just an animal, you don't have to control your sexual urges. You don't have to control your, your urges to do harm. You, don't, you just do whatever you will as the whole of the law because you're just an animal. You're, how many know we're not just an animal? We are created in the image of God. It denies. And now Darwinism has gotten so ridiculous that, well, where did man, we, we can't say that we just happened by happenstance and we came out of the, the primordial ooze, you know, that the amoeba became a more complex style animal and finally became a fish and finally the fish got up out of the water to see what was going on, you know. Then it became a monkey. Then a monkey became a man. They don't even buy that anymore. The two most preeminent Darwinianists on the planet believe in panspermia. That means that E.T., the little greys or whatever, another race came and seeded the DNA and created and a genetic experiment, experiment created mankind. Kind of sounds like Genesis 6, not Genesis 1 to me. And so... Which is harder to believe you were created by an almighty God or that an E.T. came up from another universe and did a genetic experiment on this planet and created mankind? Well, then you got to go, well, then who created them? Well, there was another alien race that came up. Well, you got to go back somewhere. You got to have to run into a God or in, into a, a cosmic accident which takes greater faith to believe in that than an almighty God. Can you see the futility of this? In fact, with the things of the Nephilim and the giants, did you know that there is a concerted effort to cover that up worldwide? That if, if and this, this, had, this happened here a few years ago in Illinois, these people are digging an underground pool to put, in their, to put on their property behind their house. They find a 10-footer, a 10-foot skeleton in their backyard. They're saying, hey, we found a giant in our backyard. There are giants in America. Whoa. And so they, they tell the newspaper. As soon as it hits the papers, the Smithsonian shows up, boxes it up, and carts it off, and it's never seen again. And that happens over and over and over again. Why? Because there is a purpose to Darwinian theory that if you have anything contrary to it, like we weren't the only ones, there was genetic experiments, all these different things, it's all carted away. In fact, one of the problems L. M. Arzuli has had is when he shows up to these museums outside the country, they have all these alien skulls and, and different things. A lot of times, if he doesn't get there quick enough, it's been bought up, boxed up, and shipped off. Concerted effort. Because it goes contrary to what the dark knowledge wants us to understand. Even Flavius Josephus said that in the days that he was there and Jesus was there, there was Nephilim bones on display in Jerusalem so that the, that generation could remember what they fought off and how the power of God helped them overcome a superior force that had, were technologically advanced, that 10, 15 feet tall. What does that have to do with anything? Because I think we're going to see, Jesus said, as in the days of Noah, so it will be when the coming of the Son of Man. That means they're back. There's a lot of spirits back for a while that has been taking man off a cliff. All of our politicians are either stuck on stupid or they're being fed dark knowledge. It sounds brainy. There's an anointing to it. They get caught up in it, but it's taking us somewhere that we don't want to go. But how many know God has an answer? John 14 and 4, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive. A mason cannot receive the spirit of truth unless he renounces Freemasonry because he has already bowed his knee at a trapezoid shape altar, which is a satanic altar, and asked for Lucifer to give him light. You say, oh, Brother Mike, word for word. Well, that doesn't happen until you get in the higher degrees. No, word for word, when you become a mason, First level, level one, Blue Lodge. The first ritual they go through is word for word, step by step, the exact same ritual you use to become a witch. Word for word. How many know at that moment they received another spirit? Now you can say that you love Jesus, but if you've not renounced that spirit, the spirit of truth cannot be in you. 
And what really scares me is we have a lot of 33rd degree Freemasons that are presidents of Baptist seminaries and, and other kinds of seminaries. How many know that those seminaries are going like this? There's a, there's a double stream. There's another anointing taking them off. Because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you. Now he's talking to disciples pre-Calvary. You've been with me. I've walked with you for three and a half years. You saw the Holy Ghost come on me at the baptism when, when John baptized me. And you have seen him functioning. You have been around him all this time. Now he has, he has dwelt with you, but he's getting ready to dwell in you. The spirit of truth. One of the things we need to do in our morning prayers is spirit of truth be released in my life. Spirit of truth, I choose, my, I choose to yield myself to you, and I come against the spirit of error in my life. Man, if you'll start doing that, you'll start making better decisions. God will start showing you stuff. Yeah. That's good. That's good. Look at this in John 15, 26. And when the comforter is come, whom I will send to you from the Father, even the spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. What does the spirit of Antichrist do? It does not testify of Jesus. There are so many blessings God wants you to walk in, but the only access point to it is Jesus. That's why if you keep all the commandments and you forget who Jesus is, you can't walk in the blessing. You can't do it. There are a lot of Sabbath-keeping, feast-keeping people that are not walking in the blessings of God because somehow or another, Jesus has been lost in the mix. Jesus is the epicenter of everything. It begins and ends with Jesus. He's the Alpha and the Omega. He's the Aleph and He's the Tav. He's the beginning and the end. All the stuff in between is the blessing. It's got to start with Jesus and end with Jesus. The spirit of truth will lead you into what Jesus has done for you, what Jesus wants for you, what Jesus wants to empower you in and your divine destiny in God. All of it's wrapped up in Jesus, but it's the job of the spirit of truth to loose it into your life, and it's the job of the spirit of error to keep you away from it. Howbeit, this is John 16, 13 through 15. Howbeit, when the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into a little bit of truth that really isn't exciting. <laughs> Boring stuff. This stuff you hear at church, you know. That stuff ain't right. You know, the mic's just preaching. Or the preacher's just preaching. He will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak of himself. The Holy Spirit will not be braggadocious about the Holy Spirit. If you have a spirit coming to you and all he talks about is, is I'm the Spirit and I'm the Spirit and I'm the Spirit, it's not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's here to talk about Jesus. But whatever he shall hear, that he will speak, and he will show you things to come. Not only is he going to give you wisdom on how to live in the kingdom of God, he's going to show you how to prepare for even what the enemy's doing. He's going to help you prepare for what God's doing. And he shall glorify me. Well, congregations that always glorify the Holy Spirit, are we letting the Spirit flow? Is it another spirit? Because if the Holy Spirit flows, who's he going to glorify? Jesus. For he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore I say that, the, that he shall take of mine and shall show it unto you. The way to the deep things of God is through the spirit of truth. But it will always be Jesus-centered. I can, I can teach on the Nephilim in Genesis chapter 6 because it's still centered on Jesus because Jesus said it's going to be this way in the last days and if you're going to walk right with me you've got to understand them but if you understand them you also understand more of Jesus because they're against him yeah. we've got to begin crying out guys you're being taught every day not just when you're, you're being taught every day. You're being taught while you're in school. You're being taught at work. How many of us have had experiences in life and have had bad things happen to us that was trying to teach us the wrong things? I had a stepfather that there wasn't a week go by that he told me that I was stupid, that I was good for nothing, and that I would never matter. And those words haunted me. I had four doctorates, and I still felt like a fool until finally one day, God showed up and said, let me tell you what I say about you. 
You see, he was being used of another spirit to teach me all the wrong things. And there are a lot of things that have happened in your life. It wasn't good things. How I many know it wasn't a God thing? And it was to get you to accept lies that you're nothing. My Bible says, for God so loved you that he went to the cross for you. That God thinks about you all the time and they're good thoughts. That he wants the best for you. That he wants to do wonderful things in your life. And that when you make the wrong decisions, it hurts the heart of God. Not necessarily because you went with him. He knows what it's going to do to you. This week I went through a situation where somebody that I knew really wasn't walking with God and and some things happened and and I I was kind of grieving over it. And God said, now you know a little bit. He said, listen, they, they, they were of me, but they didn't know me, and they, they went on to be without me. How I many of the Bible says that when, that when someone evil passes away, God doesn't rejoice in that? Because he knows the possibilities of what they denied their whole life. And he knows what it's going to cost them. When an evil person dies, God grieves because he sees the possibilities of what should have been. But where, but where the spirit of the world took them and damned them to a devil's hell and it left hell on their lives from beginning to end. I mean, even men like Hitler, how many know that God had a better purpose for him? Yes. He could have filled the world full of love instead of the travesty that he did. But he listened to another spirit and was groomed by the occult and the Thule society. Before that, he was a nobody. He was a corporal in World War I. He was, tried to be a, a, a very unsuccessful union organizer. But he was enamored with the occult, and an occultic society took him in called the Thule Society. And he had mentors that trained him how to move an occult power to do what he did. Boy, if, somebody, if a preacher could have got a hold of him and told him about Jesus and who Jesus really was... But you see, they set the ground because how many know the, the spirit, this like how there was the, the Pentecostal movement in America where the Spirit of God was moving in miracles? That happened in Europe, and this was before World War I, that the evangelical society in Germany, uh, the seminary in, in Berlin, declared this was not of God and rejected the Holy Spirit. And when they did, they opened up the door to another spirit that took them away from Jesus. And you had World War I, you had World War II. And a lot of the things that are going on in the old cult today all stem from Nazi Germany. Everybody, anybody ever hear of the skull and crossbones up in Yale? It's a black Masonic lodge. Where did it come from? Germany. Do you see a pattern? Germany. Rege- well, why? Well, in their infinite wisdom, one of the things they did in Berlin is they brought up two archaeological artifacts. One was the, the Ishtar Gate in Babylon, which is the gate of hell. And the other one was they went down to, to, to Pergamos and they uh, brought up the throne of Satan. So in Berlin museums right now, you have the gates of hell and the, and the throne of Satan setting in Berlin. No wonder there were two world wars came from there. No wonder Nazism was birthed in Berlin. And it's not done yet. But how many know we serve a God that's greater? why I'm trying to share some of this stuff with you. You can see the result of dark knowledge. You can see the result of listening to this other spirit. And God is saying, I want to take you to the next level. I want to to bless you. I want to turn some things around in your life. And to do that, you got to get in this book and you got to let the Holy Spirit teach you. Because guys, I, I have seen men that were far superior to me in hermeneutical and exegetical skills in interpreting the word. And see, one of the things that Pentecostals like to say, you get so deep in that, that you, when, you, when you exit Jesus, you can actually X out Jesus in the Bible. You can if you don't let the Spirit of God teach you. You can have the tools and the techniques without the anointing of the Holy Spirit, and you come to all the wrong conclusions. How many are tired of coming to the wrong conclusions in your life? I'm tired of making the wrong decisions. I'm, I'm, I'm tired of, of dealing with things of something that I set in motion 20 years ago that I'm trying to find the wisdom of God on how to get it to start rolling the other way. And what God is here to say now is the spirit of truth is being released in the earth in a greater way for this generation than ever before. But we have got to allow him to do his thing. Holy Spirit, come be the spirit of truth in my life. Every day we've got to call, Holy Spirit, come and teach me what I need to learn today. 
open my eyes that I can see what the enemy is doing and I can resist what he's trying to teach me. And I can learn what you want to teach me. And then give me the grace to implement it because I want to build a life that's worth living. Your life is not created by happenstance. It's created by what you speak, what you think, and what you do. Those three things that if you flow with God in those three areas, the devil cannot keep you down. You'll end up coming back up. You can be thrown into the lion's den and come back out a victor. You can be thrown into the fiery furnace and end up with the fourth man in the fire. The spirit of this world cannot, do, cannot outdo the spirit of God. But we have got to work with him. I pray that the eyes of your eyes would be opened by the spirit of God, that you could see the hope of your calling. That you can know what the depth, the height, the breadth of the love of God is for you and how great he loves you and how much he wants for you, how much he wants his power to flow through you, how much he wants you to be able to not only pray the right things for the right things, but to see those things manifested in your life. Didn't James say this? said your problem is you're praying for all the wrong things. Why? Because you're having another spirit teach you what you should be praying for. It's time for the spirit of truth, guys. It's time for the spirit of truth. And Father, right now, this morning, in the name of Jesus, I'll loose an anointing, not, to, not just to everyone here, but Father, to anyone who would listen to this on the internet or on DVD. Father, I ask that the spirit of truth would invade their lives. Father, invade every single area of their lives and not let the spirit of the world teach them any longer. But, Father, let them have the, uh, the Jeremiah anointing to root out, to pull down, to overturn, to destroy all the teaching the world has given them. And, Father, to be established on the rock of Jesus and his kingdom and to learn to function in the kingdom of God the way you desire for us to. Father, let us move and breathe and have our being in your spirit of truth, we ask. In Jesus' name.